Yes, we're in a young stand, the result of the clear cut, but what we have is actually a shade tolerant, fast growing, climate adapted species that's actually dominating this clear cut, which is kind of interesting. It is because most of our clear cuts have, we've seen it for a number of years, have come back with four main species. You've got white birch, poplar, red maple, and balsam right. fir. Coming out here, this is kind of a treat to see something that's a little different, that is, you know, a little less on the fur side. So anything over a meter, anything under a meter doesn't yep. count. Okay, we've got another red, another red, a white birch. Okay. Non-commercial. So, we should probably get an average height of the hardwoods and softwoods. Sounds good. Yeah, so we're th at 30% red maple in that plot. Uh, thinning is definitely desirable here. Yeah. So the recommendation is thinning. Is to thinning, to pre-commercial thinning. Yeah, it's to thinning. From the point of view of climate change, adaptation, and resilience, what crop trees would you select to retain? What would, you know, what would you leave? What would you try to grow and what would you cut? I'd be looking for these single stemmed red maple. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the fir is something that uh, was always favored in the past. Mm. Right now, I would be taking the faster growing red maple and removing the fir and probably the birch, mm. unless it created holes or something like that. So this big white pine that we see left here from yes. obviously hundreds and hundreds of years ago, how was white pine predicted to do? Very well. Very well. So we could see more of these. Uh, we see yeah, a few got, little region here. Exactly. Yeah, I know white pine has a massive range, massive mm -hmm. uh, genetic diversity. And we're, you know, it's, it's always grown in our historical climate. And as you pointed out earlier, it, it, there used to be a lot more of it out here on this plant. Absolutely. And I think we've seen with the fir just how high risk it is with last spring. Mm. Uh, it was quite common. You were driving along any of the highways, and all of a sudden in the spring, there was these crimson fur. Yeah. They were everywhere and people started to notice them up calls into DNR yeah. and they were trying to figure out, you know, what had suddenly killed those those fur. Right. Um, which at the at the end of it they've come up with just sudden death, winter drying, a warm day in March and it started growing. It thought it was because it's so aggressive, takes you know, advantage of, of a good situation, it started growing, but it was still frozen yeah. and basically kind of starved itself out and right. and so uh if we start seeing things like that with the fluctuations in the climate, we're probably going to see more things like that happening. And even with these two right here next side by side, you've got actually white birch. You've got two high risk species here. Yep. So in this case, from what you've said, my advice to the thinner would be get rid of the fur. And if you had to choose between the two, leave the white birch because as the stand grows on, it's not going to be able to regenerate under the, the canopy of, yep. of the red maple. <laughs> so. Yeah, you're eliminating that high-risk seed source by mm -hmm. cutting it off before it becomes sexual mature. You're maintaining a tree that's not going to have, have a negative influence on the future climate change resilience of the stand. Right. It's going to die out mm -hmm. and not regenerate. And then, you know, the reality is, is that that tree is growing and it's producing leaves every year and producing leaf drop that's buffering acidity on this, you know, not, it's not a rich site. So that buffering of acidity is going to create a soil condition that's more conducive to, to hardwood regeneration as well. Okay. Right? I mean, if you grow pure softwood on sites like this, you can actually make them more acidified, right? Okay. which will favor more softwood regeneration. Yeah. Also, okay, the poplar, we do have a few of them over here. Right. So it would be the same thing. If you had your choice, you can leave the poplar once again because it does like to I have would, the sun. Over the fur. The, over the fur, yeah, From a climate because it needs the sun really to regenerate. Yeah, despite the fact that it's not expected to do well. It certainly looks happy right now. For this, for the next 40 years, <laughs> and then we'll see what happens. It's growing really fast right now. Isn't that amazing to leave, to leave poplar, poplar over fur? fur. Yeah. That's going to require a lot of change, not only in minds, uh, mindset, not only of landowners, yeah. but also of um, personnel who are making criteria and promoting uh, of our thinning criteria. Because right. then if we're having... You know, poplar chosen over fir. Yeah. That good luck getting that one past some people. <laughs> exactly. That's that's a real hard mindset to change. Yeah, well, it's a matter of shifting your strategy towards climate change adaptation versus growing so just maximizing softwood timber supply. 
because um, even leaving the fur from from the software industry's perspective is is a lot is is you know the sort of um I mean, if that was, they, they would prefer that to be a spruce, mm -hmm. but they'll take the fur if that's all absolutely. they got. Absolutely. Oh, right. absolutely sort of right now. If, if we were to leave red maple and fur and spruce from a climate change perspective at a stand level, that's better than all fur and spruce. At least we have some species in the stand that are, that are, that are climate change adapted, right? I mean, because, I mean, a landowner might say, well, I'd rather grow that fur for 50 years. Maybe the right answer to the landowner, well, make sure you, leave, you grow both. But if, if you stream. put everything into keeping your fir and your spruce and hoping that, you know, they're small now, 40 years down the road, hopefully to get a crop off it, and all of a sudden come 35 years, they're stressed or dying out, as we saw the fir do, um, then uh, you're going to lose, your, lose your, your whole investment yeah. and be left with nothing. When you and I both know, I mean, if, if this was a stand, which is common as well, that had full stocking of fir and spruce, mm -hmm. what would happen here typically is that all the hardwood would be cut and the fir and the spruce would be spaced. Absolutely. So we'd end Absolutely. up with one treatment, converting this to a pure softwood, softwood stand. stand. Yeah. That, would yeah. have, that would be the norm. Trying to manage your, for, your woodlot in the way that we used to manage it isn't necessarily going to bring the best return to them at this point in time. Well, I think you're right, Anne. I mean, I, and, I, and, I, and I also think um, strongly that we as forest professionals need to be continuously educating ourselves so we can actually Absolutely. be offering them be offering them the options or be, be able to respond to, to the, that value and that, that desire to, to manage for climate change. Because the reality is, is that that this is happening faster than we could have possibly predicted. It's happening faster than we can find anywhere in the rec in the sort of fossil geological records of climate change. You know, it's happening you know, very quickly. The summer drought. How many years in this in a row that there's been summer drought in this part of New Brunswick? Too many. Four or five in a row. Yeah. And then you have the extreme events in the spring yeah. with the flooding, and so that creates that changes the soil. It changes because we see a lot of. Uh, large rivers of water going through, removing topsoil, removing, you know, exposing roots and, and just really you see a lot of upheaval in the trees. You know, roots are being washed away. We're getting more runoff than we really expected. Soil erosion is happening quicker than we really had thought. So there, there seems to be a lot, of, um, a lot of change that way that people haven't started to really think about yet. Right. Although it's helpful for, for a landowner to know that balsam fir is going to become stressed. Mm -hmm. That's helpful knowledge. Yes, it is. We as professionals need to be able to help them to, so now what? Now what do I do about that? I've got lots of balsam fir trees, so now what do, do I do? Like, you know, and if the way we've been trained has been driven by the mandate of maximizing softwood production, if we just keep employing those, those tools to manage stands, we're not necessarily gonna change the outcomes towards, Absolutely. towards better climate change adaptation. Because what we would do, as you said, is we'd come in and take the hardwood out of the stand and leave the fir and spruce. So industry is also going to have to change. Yeah. We have everything based on softwood. Mm -hmm. It's going to be changing as well. Yeah. Interesting times coming. Mm -hmm. It's not your grandfather's forest. No, <laughs> true.